Hello, my friends. This is part two in a series of videos on the meaning of Vesta. In the first video, I explained what Vesta means, how it functions astrologically. I also gave some background to the development of, of that understanding. Now let's look at the specific charts of the Super Vesta people. And Super Vesta people means of the tens of thousands of charts, I forget how many have AA data, I think it's about 30,000 charts, something like that in the series 4.0 software. We pick out the ones who have Sun conjunct Vesta with the smallest orb. We go into the research feature, we do it, and here's the list. I just copied and pasted it in here, and I grayed out some of the names. I put some in yellow highlight and some in green highlight. Let me tell you about the green highlight first. The green highlight were also found in the research that was done three years ago with the smaller database. So I have here in original findings. That in original findings means this was presented in, in three years ago in 2020 at the Vibrational Astrology Conference were these three people, Gunther Luchens, I hope I'm saying his name right, Judaeus Welty, and Vita Sackville West. They were in the previous research. Now with the larger database, four more people come up. The yellow ones are the new ones. What's exciting and important here is do the new ones have the same Vesta qualities as the original three? So this becomes a little bit of a, of a test. We're going from building the model to testing the model because now we've brought in some new data to see if it works. And what we found out is that three of them pretty clearly do. Sylvia Abraham, <clears throat> excuse me, Gottfried Weber, and Juana D. Ibarburu, I struggle to pronounce that one, um, they're new. So do they have the same qualities as the, as the other three that were found? And, and they do, but Jane Meadows, who's an actress and a singer, <clears throat> she does not as obviously have the same characteristics. And that's what made us question what's going on here. How come she's different? <laughs> she's the oddball. And sometimes astrologers say, well, you know, she's an oddball. And then we, we find a bunch of things in the chart to explain it. But in vibrational astrology, we have strict rules for interpretation. And when I looked at all of her charts, it doesn't explain it. And that's where I came up with the idea that what Vesta does is it either destroys that bad thing, that misaligned thing, or it protects itself from it. So this is the name of the game. Can you come up with an even better idea? of what Vesta is doing in these charts. This is the best we can come up with. And then in the later videos in this series on Vesta, I'm going to show you how we look at some other people and oh my God, these ideas work beautifully. So the fact that our original idea was confirmed and we had to add a slightly different perspective on what exactly what Vesta does, that's called refining and improving your, your model. So it's exciting. We're getting a much clearer idea of what Vesta does. The more we apply it, the more consistently it works. We now have high confidence that we understand what Vesta does, even higher than we did before. So I hope, you know, this doesn't bore you to death, but this is how we learn things in, in a modern evidence-based system. I mean, bore you to death that, you know, you, you don't just like like look at charts and have some fancy cool idea but we you know we we develop it using the modern way of figuring out how things work so oh let me show you what those grayed out ones one are what i've been doing in my latest research is i've been removing people with an hour with a birth time on the hour we didn't used to do this we used to just take anybody regardless of the time but now i'm removing these because for the obvious reason, I'm a little bit skeptical that uh, one, this fellow, uh, two, three, four, 
let's see, five, six, seven, eight, nine people, if I got them all, about nine of the people have a birth time on the hour. Well, the chance that you're born on the hour is one out of 60. So uh, it's pretty obvious a lot of these are rounded off. They tend to be people from earlier dates, like this one was born in 1813. They tended to round off the time to the nearest hour. Hour. It's called AA because it's from a birth certificate. From a birth certificate maybe implies that it was carefully observed, but when it's on the hour, it was observed but rounded off to the hour very often. So to make sure we have the best data, I've skipped those, and of course we have to skip the ones who have very little biography. So we end up about with about one third of the charts are the ones we use. In this extreme case sampling study, there's no big problem if you miss some other super Vesta people. Maybe these people born on the hour and who do have biographical information. For example, the last two, Rene Cousinet, or Cousinet, if you, depending on how you pronounce it, and Patrick Vuernet, uh, we have biography for them. We have a pretty good amount of biography for them, but I skipped them anyway because of the round number time. Others, you see, it says little bio. Um, so I give the reason why, whether it was little bio or the, or the time. If it's little bio, we definitely can't use it. So anyway, these are, on the next slide, there they are summarized. The big seven. Again, the ones in yellow highlight are new. The ones in green highlight are the ones we've seen before in the research three years ago. So is there a consistent theme? Yes, there is. The consistent theme in their lives is destroying what they consider impure or ugly, or they build a, a world with a wall around it. They live in this little bubble, sometimes a big bubble, to protect themselves from that ugliness out there. And usually they've experienced some pretty striking ugliness in the social world around them, and they just say, I don't want to be part of that. I mean, nobody does. And they just get themselves really, really seal themselves and create another world to live in where that's not infected by greed, avarice, poverty, stress, suffering, etc. These misalignments, you can call them. Okay, so I've already talked about this in the first video that Vesta View, well, we'll this is stated a little differently, so I'll go over it again very quickly. Vesta views our immediate biological lives as vulnerable because there are bacteria, viruses, hatred, animosity of all kinds, cruelty that destroy our lives, <clears throat> destroy the quality of our lives. Vesta's mission is to either quarantine ourselves from these evils and to create a barrier so that they cannot enter our lives or to exterminate these threats to our lives. Vesta is so intent on removing these threats to our lives that it will sometimes go to extremes to ensure that we are free of these threats, as we shall see when we look at these seven people. I want to mention one more thing. Even though all of these charts have AA data and they are not on the hour, there is a little bit of a question about whether the Jane Meadows birth time is really accurate. Um, I looked into this and I found this website I'll quote what it says about how times are recorded in different places. The People's Republic of China issued its first birth certificate in January 1996. Jane Meadows, well, well, when we get to her chart, she was born in like 1919 or something. She's born way before there were birth certificates required in China. The birth certificate used currently is the fifth edition. Anyway, they've gone through, you know, how what's on the birth certificate. Still, China, the world's most populous country, is among those with no globally comparable data, presenting challenges to researchers who wish to assess global and regional progress towards universal birth registration. They just were not very good about birth times, um, recording them or even being careful about notating the time. When you go back to 1919, very unlikely. Now, if you were born on a military base, it, it might observe, well, would almost certainly observe the standards of military bases. They would be more careful. She was not born on a military base. So how could the time be so precise? When birth certificates were not issued, there was no reason to take note of the specific time. It was not a cultural uh, habit 
to, to record times that accurately. Uh, and her birth time is 201. It looks suspicious that maybe somebody wanted to make it look official. So instead of making it two, they put one. I don't know. Anyway, just something to be aware of. But even if her time was made up to, and made to look like it was accurate when they make this document, um, that's uh, essentially her parents were missionaries doing, you, you know, religious, um, you know, supporting religious uh, way of life in China, you know, Christian religious missionaries. Um, and, and then part of that is documentation of the birth and that documentation had a time on it. But I want to note that even if the time was completely wrong, Vesta stayed within 20 minutes of the sun throughout the day. Should that would mean she was not a super uh, Vesta person, according to our criteria, but she still has Vesta strong. Anyway, a little technical note. Let's get into this. Here are the seven people. Let's start off and look at Sylvie Abraham. Is she destroying misalignments in nature or creating a barrier? Well, here's her chart first. <clears throat> um, there's the sun conjunct Vesta with a one minute orb. That means that Vesta is going to be conjunct the sun all the way up into higher vibrations. It gets the orb gets bigger, but it's there. There should be some kind of Vesta tone. There must be a Vesta tone in her life. Again, not necessarily the central thing, but it's got to be when the orb is that small, according to the rules of vibrational astrology. Now, who is this lady, Sylvia Abraham? She's a cosmetic surgeon. That's what she does. Let's learn more about it. This is her website. So that's what she looks like um, at the time. Well, this is her website now. So that's the picture she put up there of herself. Dr. Sylvie Abraham. This is the home page. And there's the website address, by the way, on the slide. It's, fr it's, all, it's in French. Um, actually, it came up in English. I don't know if it did an automatic translation. Or, or what. But anyway, um, the name of the website is obviously French. So here's a quote from a website, and I give the website about her. So we're looking at some things on her website. And you might say, well, she's a cosmetic surgeon. Why is this lady, you know, showing her breasts and touching her nipples? And what does this have to do with these big red lips? Uh, here's an, another lady, uh, you know, naked. And this lady... Here. Well, she does cosmetic surgery for, uh, as they call it here, intimate male and female surgery. So this is what she focuses on, making you more beautiful, more handsome, um, and more attractive. So Sylvia, I'll, I'll read from this uh, website that talks about her. Sylvia Abraham, MD, is a board-certified plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Her area of expertise is aesthetic, intimate male and female surgery, a field where she is a pioneer, having developed many innovative procedures. She's a speaker at numerous national and international meetings for plastic and aesthetic surgery, as well as for sexology, gynecology, and urology. Dr. Abraham has published numerous scientific papers. So she is one of the foremost uh, what's the term they use here? Uh, reconstructive surgery, focusing especially on your attractiveness sexually and just in general. She literally cuts away ugliness and imperfections. That's Vesta. I mean, that fits Vesta. Vesta sees something in nature and says, that's not quite right. That's not, it's not the beauty, the perfection, the nobility, the integrity that we want in our biology. <clears throat> Vesta theme right there. She sees it and, and she gets rid of it. And this is controversial, obviously. I mean, you know, Botox and making your face fuller, removing the wrinkles, and then, and there's no limit to what she does. I mean, she she does it all, you know, liposuction, et cetera, et cetera, and she's one of the best. She's you know, famous for this. She's uh, 
you know, highly respected. It's the Vesta view of life. And it's intense. Vesta is not inclined to be these quiet, you know, the Vestal virgins protecting the sacred flame. You know, it goes in with, <laughs> with a knife. It's saying, there's a bacteria. It's causing disease. Kill it. There's ugliness. Get rid of it. So there's your Vesta theme. A quote from her website, translated from, from the French, so it might be a little bit awkward, um, you know, the, the Google translate of it. Beautification by correcting a defect of nature, nose, chin, double chin, or ears. Listen to the words. Beautification by correcting a defect of nature. <laughs> she says it. She says the Vesta words. It's a defect in nature. Now you may say, well, you know, there's no defects in nature. That's just, that's not the Vesta view. This is the Vesta view. She's going to fix those defects. This lady's brilliant. She's one of the greatest surgeons. And what does she do with her brilliance and her and her? In dedication, all of her study, she gets rid of the defects in nature. She fixes the deep and the intensity and severity of the operations. And, you know, it's, it's pretty intense stuff. Some people might say, well, you know, maybe you should just like try to lose some weight, change your diet, or just cut it away. Um, and by the way, technical note, I confirmed that this, this Sylvie Abraham is the Sylvie Abraham in the database. I found a an article. Here's the article address. Said she was 51 years old in August 2005. That's her. Anyway, um, the the biographical information in the in in Sirius it just says Sylvie Abraham. The link that it sends you to doesn't clarify. That's that's her. That's the Sylvie Abraham in our database. Um, so that's that's number one. That's Sylvie Abraham. Fits. She's a good fit. Let's go down to the next one. Next one of the seven people is Gunther Lugens. I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name. And he was discussed in the in the research three years ago in 2020. There's his birth chart, and there I highlighted the sun conjunct Vesta. Again, one minute orb. Extremely tight. He's the second of the seven people. He was a German military admiral in World War I and World War II. He was a commander of the battleship, the Bismarck, in historical, in historic battles in 1941. So he's part of the, the Nazi military in World War II. He was a commander of this battleship and he was involved in historic battles. There's a picture of him. You're going to see in these pictures of Super Vesta people a similar look among many of them. Doesn't mean that if you have Sun Conjunct Vesta, you need to have this look and appearance. Not necessary, but many of them do. In fact, one of them conspicuously does not, which is Jane Meadows, as we will see. She doesn't have the sternness, that stern look, the, the flat, or even in his case, going down a little bit, lips. You know, you don't get the feeling he... He's a jovial, light-hearted guy. A lot of these Sun Vesta people are stern and also elegant, upright, sharp, kind of clean, kind of good-looking. And they tend to be trim even because they don't like ugliness and they, they have that Vesta attitude. So you can see it there. Um, but it doesn't always come out that way, as you'll see with Jane Meadows. She takes a different approach to, to, to Vesta. And at some point, I'm hoping that we can understand in more detail why she took that approach. Maybe it's because she has stronger nine vibration or something than these other people. But in any case, right now, we know that these two approaches happen. So the stern countenance and the kind of elegance, sometimes an aristocratic air, you'll see that common for Sun Vesta. Um, no funny business. <laughs> They're going to go in and, and do what needs to be done. 
So he was a protector of his country, the quiet devotion to protect his nation. He pr no, this is interesting, and this is very much like Vesta, what Vesta often does. He protested against Hitler's torture and murder of Jews. So just torturing Jews because they're Jews, he didn't support that idea. But otherwise, he executed his duties faithfully and effectively after conferring with others. He came to his own decisions. He was resolute and taciturn. Some people saw him as humorless, inflexible, rather forbidding. You can kind of see that in that picture. And that was true. I mean, that's just one picture. But according to Grand Admiral Eric Reeder, he was an effective and intrepid leader and a perfect commander. He lived as a gentleman, fought as a gentleman, and died with honor. So that is the Vesta style. There is an integrity, a sincerity, a strength in what they're doing. Here's one way to look at what's going on with this fellow. It appears that he was happy to kill Jews. And, you know, I mean, he didn't like the, the murder of them, but, but going to war to, you know, the concentration camps, apparently he was against that. Give him some credit for that, at least. But he is a leading commander for the Nazi military, who's got an agenda of wiping out the enemy and the enemy of this pure lifestyle, this Aryan race, this upright way of being, this, you, you know, they have certain music and certain lifestyle, and this is the right and proper way, very narrow, very narrowly defined, not very open, and canceling and killing and destroying a lot of things that now we understand are perfectly good and beautiful. This is the the way that Vesta becomes so enraptured with its idea of purity, a narrow, it becomes a bigoted narrow perspective on what is right and what is beautiful and what is good. So he is part of this. And in fact, we're going to find out there are two German military generals of the top seven people. What's the probability of that? So this is one of the negative sides of Vesta. They become righteous, bigots, because they think all these other things are dirty. And they're, they're, they're not the kind of pure and clean thing that they want in their lives. And in a very a gentle way, I think Jane Meadows is guilty of that as well, in, despite all of her sweetness of insulating herself and looking at all that as like the rubble out there. They conceal themselves off into this narrow, bigoted uh, way of life that becomes extremely destructive. If you didn't have admirals, generals, lieutenants commanding the Nazi army, then all of the destruction that the Germans caused in World War II and their allies, Japan, etc., would not have happened. Um, so you see the, the negative side of it. Now, here's our third strongest person. She was also in the original study. She also kills. A fairly good number of, of our top Vesta people have killed people either in war or in personal murder. And she goes by various names, by the way. Judaeus Welty, Welty, Judy Goodyear, Judy Buenoano. So she's changed her name. Uh, she married a fellow named Goodyear. So that was her married name. And then she made a Spanish version of it. Bueno means good. Uh, ano means year. Bueno. So she made up her, that name. So she's the third person. She was convicted of murder of her husband, boyfriend, and son. I mean, I mean, how crazy do you have to be? Well, one of my hopes, you know, for vibrational astrology is that we can understand how such sick, malicious things can happen. And it's pretty clear she did it. I mean, it's not just that the, you know, that particular, um, you know, group of people decided she, she, she's, the evidence was overwhelming. 
And here's where the trauma steps in. Her mother died when she was four years old. Okay, that's not the worst part of it. She grows up with her father and stepmother, was abused along with her sibling. She claimed that her father and stepmom abused her and forced her to work as a slave. At 13 years old, on 13 years on, death row, now writing letters. Oh, so she was on death row in, in prison uh, for 13 years. And what did she do? She crocheted blankets and baby clothes. She taught Bible studies to inmates. Uh, so here's a lady who kills her husband, boyfriend, and son, and probably others, and she's teaching Bible studies. Huh? It makes perfect sense. That's what Vesta does. Vesta, these evil people or dysfunctional people from all of her traumatic experiences, she eliminates them. Vesta can be so severe. You know, in war, you can be a war hero for killing bad people. You know, those of us who think of ourselves as, you know, well, we're not so insane. We can see killing as noble. And she sees it as noble. Um, or, I don't know, the word noble is right. She thought it was okay to do. So, when Vesta gets so strong and the person saying, this is evil, this is evil, this is evil. These people turn me into slaves, just kill them. Um, so it's like the righteous wrath of God, right? That righteous wrath of God, it's like Vesta themes running through a lot of religion, right? Can you, can you feel this? It gets kind of scary that there's actually a method to the madness pretty darn scary that there's actually a logic to what she's doing as horrific as it is so trying to get you into the mood of how vesta works and as astrologers practicing and trying to be therapeutic and help you can see what we need to do to correct these things, to get Vesta to be channeled properly, that the person's very limited idea of what purity is and how to exterminate evil goes out of bounds. And it becomes sometimes more destructive than what they're trying to get rid of. And that's what happens. So a lot of evil can come out of Vesta. Here's another picture of her. There's that similar look. There's almost a kind of pride or dignity involved like she's looking at you with her own way of evaluating you um, and listen to this you know they get a last meal she was uh, you know i think she was executed yeah she was executed for what she did her last meal consisted of broccoli asparagus strawberries and hot tea that's a really a vesta thing to do fairly elegant it's vegetarian. A lot of Vesta people are inclined to be vegetarian. I'm not saying she was vegetarian, but her last meal, broccoli and asparagus, strawberries, hot tea. Um, when asked if she had any last words, Bueno Ano said, no, sir. No, sir. <laughs> it's very Vesta-like. Intense, quiet, integrity, no remorse, no crying. No, sir. Boom. This is what she did. This is what she believed in. And she goes forth. Her righteous wrath, that's what she did. <clears throat> Just think of it this way. Vest is going to exterminate or protect itself from evil. And she exterminated it. A little bit more about her. She was reunited with her father in Roswell, New Mexico. After his next marriage, so her mother died, father gets married sometime later, and she goes back to be with her father. She found herself the target of abuse from both parents. So now she's got a stepmom who beat, star, burned with cigarettes, forced to work slave hours around the house. I mean, how do people get this sick? And you have somebody with son Vesta, 
experiencing this, she exterminates them. At age 14, her anger finally exploded. Judy scalded the two of her stepbrothers with hot grease, lit into her parents with flying fists, feet, and any object she could lay her hands on. The episode cost her 60 days in jail, confined with adult prostitutes. But when the judge asked if she was ready to go home, she chose reform school. Well, that was a good choice. I mean, why go back to that insanity? So Vesta, faced with that level of evil, uh, murders it. She poisoned her victims with arsenic. At least one victim had a life insurance policy that was started or increased in value within a few years of the murders. She taught Bible studies. I talked about that to other inmates. Vesta can destroy and kill what it finds unacceptable to marriage, family, country, and personal life. Vesta does not compromise. That's an important thing about Vesta. It just goes in, eliminate. Um, it applies its antiseptic to kill the disease. Of the first three super Vesta people, two of them have killed people, one in war and the other in murder. Now, here's the exception to the rule. The fourth person, Jane Meadows. Well, she's not a, she's an exception to the rule of being severe, eliminating, antiseptic, just go in, wipe it out. She does the protection thing. And look at her face. You know, this is, this is Jane Meadows. She's all peaches and cream. She's all sweet and lovely um, and has this kind of innocent, beautiful way about her. So she's the fourth person. She was an actress and a singer. She was also famous for being married to Steve Allen. Steve Allen was uh, extremely famous back in, I guess that would be the 50s and 60s. Um, and uh, so she was married to him and she, she did a lot of acting and uh, she was a host of a TV show, very famous for that as well. But Steve Allen, there's, he was a uh, very recognizable name even today. Um, so what's her son investor? I didn't highlight it, but there it is. They are two minutes apart, two Libra 36 and two Libra 38. So Vesta should be toning her life, her style, her way of doing things. And she's just the opposite. There she is again. Just very pleasant, not the sternness. She's happy. She's a happy person. Um, Jane Meadows was a talk show host, an actress, and a singer. Her parents were missionaries in China, and Jane was born there. She was born in China. So her parents are uh, religious missionaries. She's born in China, and she speaks Mandarin fluently. In fact, she did not speak English as a child. All of this is important for understanding her later life. So you've got this little girl, an American girl, born in China, but she's basic, she's Chinese. I mean, she speaks Mandarin, you know. Um, she's, and she saw the struggles of the Chinese people. These were difficult times for China. And, and war started to break out. And in fact, her, the home and the family were now in danger and they kind of left the last minute and got out just in time. So that war was coming in and they managed to escape before they were stuck there and could have, you know, been victims of war. So she saw these struggles of the Chinese people. Her parents left the country when the war started. Then she gets to the United States. And then she, as a child, I think she was born in 1919. Let's see what it is. Yeah, 1919. So the... Depression was 1929, so she's about 10 years old when the United States goes through its worst economic situation. And she talks about it. I watched some big interviews of her where she's interviewed for an hour. It's one of the things I like about fairly contemporary people. You can go to YouTube, find these videos, listen to her talk, uh, you know, and what she's written, other interviews that are written down, etc. And she talks about how horrifying the Great Depression was. She saw people just lives ruined, houses lost. You, she's 10 years old. She's smart enough to know, to know what's going on. She's innocent enough for this to be shocking. Um, so she goes through two experiences in China, leaving a war. And she's 
She only speaks Mandarin. She gets to the United States. She doesn't even speak English. She's got to learn English. And and then she sees the, the this horrific things that happen when there's poverty, when there's war, when things can happen and how vulnerable we are. She saw her own parents lose a lot of their wealth, safety, and well-being. She saw neighbors, same thing. She saw the vulnerability. A key part of her life that is important for understanding her later development is what I just said. She didn't speak English. She came here. Um, the part about not speaking English, I'm just saying she was in that dangerous world. She wasn't an outsider in it. She was in it. She escaped out. She gets to America. It's beautiful. Oh, my God. She loves it. Until the depression hits, and then she has to go through that, and then she comes out of it, and then she sees the beauty. She sees the best and the worst, and she loves her life outside of it seeing the the depression and that. Oh my God, she's very happy. She loves her life, all the the nature, the outings, everything. So she sees the best and worst of life. She embraced the great opportunities that were available to her. All these things you could do. You could go to college. Her parents were were well to do for the most part. It was beautiful life, beautiful way. <clears throat> she loved it. She pursued acting. She succeeded. And in her interview, she expresses her great love for her friends into her adulthood. She has all these friends she loves. Very healthy, very beautiful life that she lives. Uh, she appreciates so much in her life. She lived a full, productive, meaningful, and fulfilling life. I don't know if she's had any cosmetic surgery herself, but she looks great in her elder, you know, in her late years. She looks to be 90-something years old. Um, and in her interviews, totally clear, alive, lovely, engaging person. She, um, she reminisces in, um, in the interview when she's, I think, about 90 years old in the interview. She reminisces about the golden age of TV. She was a... a the uh, hostess, I guess you would say, the uh, moderator, there's another word for it, of this quiz show. Um, and she talks about, in the interview, how the salaries were not outrageously high for people then. It wasn't this crazy, like, insane thing. They had a good life, a beautiful life. They had money, they had, but it was good, it was wholesome, it was true, it wasn't wasn't blown out of proportion with insane celebrity status, making insane amounts of money, good, healthy, great friendships, wholesomeness saturated her entire life. This was the post-World War II era in the United States, before the rebellions from the hippies and others rebelled and said, there's something wrong here. There's, what, what are we doing in this Vietnam War? We're going in there. There's something underneath that's ugly. The America of the 50s kind of ignored all that. It, it ignored the racism. It you know, just, just had, had this beautiful tone. And a lot of it was set by the TV. People got TVs. They had these black and white TVs, these little TVs in their room. And it set a cultural tone. She was one of the people who created that cultural tone of enjoyment, of well-being, of loving your family, of having good schools, of having good police that protect you, of being safe. The kids used to play outside, not worry. People didn't even lock their doors. It was This was the world that she reminisces about. The world that also avoided, ignored, some of the very ugly things that were going on. So, she's famous as the host of I've Got a Secret, which aired from 1952 to 1967. 1967 is when things start to change uh, radically with the wilder rock and roll and counter culture, you might say, becomes stronger. There is, however, a problem with this golden age of TV. I watched several episodes of the show Doing this research requires a lot of time, you know, understanding who she is, what she was doing. In one ep episode, just to give you an idea of what I, concrete examples of living in a bubble and ignoring 
some of the evil that's there. This is what she did. She grew up in a country that became war-torn. War she comes to America. She sees the Depression. She says, I am not going to be part of that. I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to create this world. And, I'm going to and she becomes part of this talk show where it's all fun and beautiful and sweet. And in one episode I watched, there was a Winston Cigarettes promotional sign. The guy's got a sign on his, on his desk there, table, saying Winston Cigarettes. And, you know, it's fun. They're the sponsors, and it's all good. And he's chain-smoking cigarettes, and he's funny, and, you know, it's kind of cute and adorable in, in that way that things were. Um, so... And you get the usual displays of respect and appreciation for the American military every few episodes and other aspects of life. What do we know now? We know that cigarette companies hid from people the evidence that smoking causes cancer. They hid it from us, from, from people. They just wanted to make the money. Um, it causes cancer. It's not just some fun, cool, funny thing. So what I'm saying is that she was one of the people who built this make-believe world where it's all good it's all sweet it's all kind it's all wonderful and no it's evil winston cigarettes <laughs> they knew what they were doing they're causing cancer destruction i'm not saying you can't smoke but you should be told the truth not being hidden <laughs> the, and and what went on with with the vietnam war people were saying we're not being honest here what's going on so anyway, they built this world where people could live in a naive and insulated world from the struggles and problems throughout the world and the struggles and problems and hypocrisies in their own world. This is what she created. This is another side of Vesta. It's how we can make sense of the data. The way we make sense of the data is that people can build this bubble. And boy, did she ever build a bubble, a beautiful, sweet bubble, a lovely person who lives in that bubble. So, um, I'll pick up with this. I just realized I'm at 42 minutes. Let's wrap this up in the third series uh, in this video. Talk a little bit more about Jane Meadows and because I want to continue this theme. And then we'll go on to all the other people who exhibit the more common approach of Vesta, which is to go out and apply the antiseptic to destroy what's bad. And she, Jane Meadows builds this incredibly wonderful bubble and watch I've Got a Secret on YouTube and enter her bubble where everything is sweet and lovely and funny and the show is fun by the way it's fun you know it's a little quiz show and you it, it, you just live in this lovely little bubble um, nothing wrong with living in a beautiful world as long as you're not avoiding reality, making believe it's all good when it isn't. So Vesta at its word, in, in one bad way, will overdo, destroy, because it has a narrow sense of what's good. In the other way, it is unwilling to face these, these evil things. You know, you can even say that about our first lady, Sylvie Abraham. You know, all this Botox and stuff is known to have problems. I mean, there are lots of problems. She's aware of it. She's a scientist. But she's willing to take that risk. Take the risk in order to get rid of the ugliness. Vesta will take those risks. It will compromise in order to get the main thing done. The main thing is to protect yourself from the disease or remove it and sometimes there's um you know some negative consequences that you just have to live in your bubble okay we'll continue with this in the third video in the series thank you very much for listening my friends god bless namaste